Welcome to the third part of my tutorial on introduction to linguistics. Today we're dealing with morphology and word formation, or in other words, the question, how do we form words and what do they even consist of? So here we have a small jigsaw puzzle. If you have the slides in front of you, those who are in my group, um, you can puzzle it together yourself, if, yourselves if you like, but I will just go through them and sort them together now. The first group we have is the morpheme. The morpheme as the basic unit of morphology is the smallest linguistic unit carrying meaning. And examples would be in, un, word or manage. Then we have the allomorph. The allomorph is the concrete realization of one of such morphemes, the most prominent example being plural, which can come in the form of the voiceless s, the voice z, or the is, but we'll get to that later. Then we have the prefix, which is a bound morpheme added to the beginning of a word, as in the examples un, in, pre, this, or non. And its counterpart is the suffix, which is a bound morpheme added to the end of a word as in er, ing, less, able, or ible, and many others. And last but not least, we have the lexeme. The lexeme is the smallest distinctive unit of a language's vocabulary. Um, then we again have manage, run, do, need, and really any other word you can think of. Then a question that we also have to ask ourselves is, what is a word? Or provocatively speaking, why are Donald Trump's speeches so bad? So again, I have another jigsaw for you, which I will just go through now. The first thing we have to talk about are tokens. Tokens are any kind of phonological or orthographical word. And if you wanted to count them, you would do so as a word processing software does. For example, when Word gives you Microsoft Word, when that gives you the, um, the word count of your essay, that's the tokens and it counts. And this happens on the parole level if we go back to our very first lesson. And um, an example would be the sentence, while I was drinking a cup of tea, he drank a glass of whiskey, contains 14 words if you count it, word by word, so whenever there's space in between, then you get 14 words. The second thing we have to talk about are word forms. And these, this is a grammatical category. So we have inflectional variants of one lexeme, as in the example drink, drank, drinking, drunken, they all go back to drink, and are all word forms of the verb drink. And last but not least, we have the lexeme, or also called the type which is the abstract unit of the lexicon. And if you want to count the types, you would do so by dictionary entries on the long level. So if we have the same sentence, while I was drinking a cup of tea, he drank a glass of whiskey, we would get to 11 words this time because we only count the articles once. So we have a uh, two times, but it's only counted once. And we only count drink and all its word forms once and off as well. And that brings us to the type token ratio, which you calculate by dividing the number of lexemes or types by the number of tokens. And obviously the higher the number gets, the, the better the choice of words is because you have more different words. And Donald Trump's speeches have a very low type token ratio most of the time. There are studies on that. So, getting to morpheme types, we have lexical free morphemes, and these are content words with lexical information, as you can see in the examples in the green boxes, words like sad, read, well, or boy, they all have some kind of lexical information that you get from them. They can stand on their own, so you don't need any other morphemes for them to make sense, as opposed to, say, ing. They're inflectable, so you can say boy or boys, for example, or read and reading. 
and they are an open class. So whenever you have something new, an invention, for example, and gets a name that might consist of one or two or more new morphemes. And classical word classes you have in here are nouns, adjectives, adverbs, and lexical verbs. Lexical bound morphemes are affixes, usually. So suffixes or prefixes, and if they are suffixes, like for example, ness or able or li or er, actually all my examples down here, um, they tend to change the word class. They don't have to, but they often do. For example, you have fit as an adjective, you add ness, you get fitness, which is a noun. And by adding these affixes, you create a new lexeme with a discrete meaning. Staying with our example, fit is be, the, the, the state of being in shape, or describes the state of being in shape, which is fitness. So basically you have to be in shape, to be fit, and if you have a good fitness, then that, yeah, I think you get it. Um, they are not infinitely produ productive, so productivity means can you attach it to many different morphemes or words, or can't you do that? And in the case of these affixes, they don't go with just anything. So for example, ER usually goes with words, uh, with verbs to form a noun, and doesn't normally go with anything else. It would sound weird if it did that. And these affixes are rather open class, so you can add something new, but it's not very likely to happen because you already have a vast array of these affixes that you can use for many things. And if you have both a grammatical bound morpheme and a lexical bound morpheme, the lexical bound morpheme is closer to the stem. So let's stay with, or let, let's go with manager. There you have manage, er, and the plural s. And in that case, you have the er closer to manage than the s would be. Then we also have grammatical free morphemes. These are function words which mark grammatical relations. So, and they also can stand on their own and they're rather relational. They, so they don't give you any lexical input. They just put the lexical information into perspective, if you will. And they are not inflectable. So if you look at the examples that I listed, and, what, she, to, you can't inflect any of that. They are a closed class, so there are no new members. The English language has the grammatical free morphemes it, it needs and that don't have to be, and there most likely will not be any new ones. So it's very hard to introduce grammatical free morphemes into a language. And the usual word classes are auxiliary verbs, pronouns like she, prepositions like to, conjunctions like and, numerals, like all that little, all the little words. And finally, we have grammatical bound morphemes. There are exactly eight of them, which you can see in the table below. And these are inflectional morphemes, so they change the grammatical status of a word. For example, if you take the plural S, you transfer the word, let's say, boy to boys, and what you basically do is you say there's more than one boy, and that's all. So you don't change the meaning, but you rather create a new word form, and you always maintain the word class. And these are a highly close class, there are these eight morphemes and no new members. So let's quickly go, go through the morphemes. We have the plural S, the possessive S, we have ing to form the present partis participle or progressive forms of verbs. Then we have the simple past marker D or ED, then the third person singular S, and the past participle marker, which looks the same as the simple past marker. Then we have ER for the comparative forms of adjectives and EST for the superlative forms of adjectives. And that's all there is. Then another jigsaw, the special snowflakes amongst morphemes. 
they are really important for the exam on a side note. So just a little hint here. First, you have the portmanteau morphemes. Portmanteau morphemes carry several meanings simultaneously. Whereas usual in the, uh, the usual case in the English language would be that one morpheme carries one meaning and another morpheme comes in and carries another meaning. And together they have a combined meaning. But in this case, you have things like caught and took, which are both either past participles or um, past simple past forms which would normally require the ed to mark them but they are just implicitly marked for the past by that form so they have both the form and the lexical content within the same morpheme which makes them a portmanteau morpheme there are also unique or blocked morphemes which only attach to one specific base and the primary example here is cran as in cranberry there is no other word with cran this cran only goes with berry, with nothing else, and that makes it a blocked morpheme. And suppletive morphemes are word forms that are etymologically completely unrelated to the original morpheme that they stem from. So we have was for to be and went for to go, and both these forms come from a different ancestor, but nowadays, they are the past form of their respective verbs, uh, verbs. So that's just something that happened in the past and that it has to be learned now. And then we have the zero morpheme, which lacks phonetic substance, as it says here, when it's inflected or it has another word form. So one example would be sheep, whose plural is also sheep. So there should be a plural S, but there is none. Or a put, put, put. So put can either be present, simple past, or the past participle without any marking. And now let's get to the plural, like I promised we would. So um, the English plural morpheme is given by a capital S. And the reason for that is that we have several different ways of how to realize this morpheme. So we have several allomorphs. And these are phonologically conditioned, which means they depend on the sound that comes before in many cases. So if we look at car, we have cars with a voiced z. And if we look at cat, we have cats with a voiceless preceding sound, as opposed to car where the r is voiced. So we can see that if we have a voiced final sound in a word, the plural S will also be voiced simply because it, it tends to assimilate because it would be exhausting to switch from voice to voiceless. So it's easier to pronounce if you just have two voice sounds in a row. And the same go, goes for cats with the voiceless T and the voiceless S. It's just easier. And then we have house which ends in a so-called sibilant. Sibilants are the voiced and the voiceless sounds for s, sh, and the affricates in English. And then we have to add is because we could, simply can't say house. That nobody would say that. So for reasons of, again, economy of the language, we say houses. And um, then we have the zero morphemes that I already mentioned, sheep and sheep. There is no plural marking at all, and that has its origin in Old English, like the irregular plurals of man and men, where we have an, a so-called I mutation. So they, there once used to be an I or a J somewhere in the back of the word, which influenced the first vowel to become more closed and fronted. And so we had um, man and men. And it, we still have it today. Ox and oxen. Then we have schwa n as the plural allomorph. That's also an English origin. And we have child and children. This is also from Old English. These are the irregular forms. They have to be learned 
by every language learner and every language learner hates them. But I believe every single language has such irregularities. And the possessive S goes according to a very similar pattern. So we have dog, dogs, again, voiced G, voiced Z, cat and cats, same example we have uh, as before. So we have the voiceless T and the voiceless S. And then we have George with the affricate at the end or sibilant, Georges. And in the case of a plural word, we don't add the plural S, as you know, so um, we have no marking at all. And about past participle and simple past, it's also not that easy. And you also saw in the table that the morpheme is given with a capital D because there are several allomorphs again. So we have the example love, 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 love. The V is voiced. So again, as with the plural and the possessive S, we add the voiced allomorph, the, for reasons of economy of the language, because it's easier to pronounce loved than loved. That's very exhausting to say it like that. And then we have the counterexample his hist, hist, so there we add a t because the t is voiceless and the, the t as well. And then we have the verb found, founded, founded, which ends in an alveolar stop, which would be in this case a d, it could also be a t in other cases, and then we have id at the end, simply because we, we would find it very difficult to say funded no, that, that just doesn't sound right. And then we have the zero plural, put, 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 no marking at all. We have portmanteau uh, plural, which again comes from Old English and from the um, declinations and conjugations of that language. An example would be sing, sang, sung. And the suppletive morphemes that I mentioned before with be, was, and been with different etymological origins for one and the same verb. And they just came together at some point to form this one conjugation that every student has to simply, simply has to learn by heart. There is no logical reason why this is like that other than the different etymologic, uh, the etymological origins. So that was morphology. Now let's get into word formation. We don't use basic lexemes all the time that would sim simply leave our language very limited. So how does word formation work? First, we have the morphemic word formation patterns. And the first example of that is derivation. So in the case of derivation, we take an affix. It could be a prefix. It could be, in sub it could be a suffix to one, one or more free morphemes, to something free. And in the case of prefixation, which, which is shown below by the, the example incorrect, the word class doesn't change. And the prefix rather changes the meaning than the word class. So we have correct as the free morpheme, and when we add in, we turn it into its opposite. And in the case of suffixation, we have the example management as manage and mint. And there we can already see that the word class has changed. Manage is a verb and mint makes it a noun. And that mainly alters the grammatical status. So the meaning is still very much related. It's just the act of managing something. It's not too far away from just manage. But we have a noun now. Next up, we have conver a conversion, which is another morphemic pattern. And there we create a new lexeme simply by changing the word class. So we have no overt suffix, the words sound the same, but we have the adjective clean, which was at some point just turned into the verb clean. And then we have the noun hand, which William Shakespeare, in fact, turned into the verb to hand like hand me the sword, hand me a sword, for example, kind of a martial example, but I think fits with Shakespeare. 
Then we have compounding as a morphemic word formation process, where we combine at least two free lexical morphemes. It could be more. And we have a head, which is the last morpheme, and a modifier of which further describes the head. And the head gets all the inflections and also determines the word class of the whole thing. And we have, of course, different types of compounds. Now, if I may give you a hint, you have two terminologies listed. Personally, I learned the second term terminology by heart because the first version contains some really hard words to remember. But let's go into it. We have determinative or endocentric compounds where the compound AB is a type of B. Our example here is the apple pie, where an apple pie is a certain type of pie, namely a pie with apples. So the apples just give more information about the pie. Then we have Bahovrihi or exocentric compounds, where the compound AB is a type of C, so something else entirely. And um, here we have the example of white color, which remotely has to do with the color of the color of a person, but um, it actually means somebody who works in an office. So it's, it's not a particular color. It's just a person who works in an office. And then we have the dvandva or copulative compound where AB is both A and B. And I picked the example of to freeze dry something here which is a process where you freeze and dry something in the same step or in one go. Now we get to the non-morphemic word formation patterns that we have clipping. And clipping basically means that we delete parts of words without changing their meaning. And a very prominent example is the refrigerator, which most people talk about as fridge. It's still the same word, still has the same meaning. It's just much shorter because the beginning and the end were cut away. And the same goes for influenza, which everybody refers to as the flu. Then we have blending, which is another non-morphemic non word formation process where both form and meaning of two words are merged. So we have, for example, Brexit, which is a result of Britain and exit. And we can see that um, the forms are pulled together. So it's burr from Britain and exit to form Brexit, which is the exit of Britain from the European Union. So you can see both form and meaning are merged. And it works the same with smoke and fog, which together form smog. Then we have acronyms another non-morphemic word formation process. And acronyms are shortened forms which retain the initial letters or another fixed sequence of words. And what makes them acronyms is their pronunciation as if they were a normal word. Examples are the NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, laser, light amplification by stimulated emission reflection, reflection and AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Similar to acronyms, we have initialisms or alphabetisms. They are like an acronym, like I said, but there each letter is pronounced on its own. So we have CNN, Cable News Network, the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, or the USA, United States of America. Then we have back formation which is a non-morphemic word formation process as well. And in that case, we delete a morpheme-like element from the word to create a new lexeme in a different word class. So for these examples, it's important to understand that the long forms were there before the short forms. So we have the editor, and someday somebody thought, hey, we need a verb for that. And they cut the OR away and came up with to edit. And the same goes for babysit. Babysitter is actually the older form. 
and then the TER was just cut away to make a verb. And last but not least, we have reduplication, another non-morphemic word formation process where a word or a word like element is repeated in an identical or mostly in a slightly modified form, as we can see with hip hop or the walkie talkie. So to conclude this video, I want to take you through a morphemic analysis, which is a typical exercise you will find in a potential exam. So your first step is to segment the word into its morphemes. And my example that I have here is mismanagement. We have three different morphemes. We have miss, we have manage, and we have meant. And the reason why I'm talking about manage all the time is that it's a popular trap amongst teachers because you could read man and age into it, but don't be fooled, it's manage. It's one morpheme. And once we've segmented the word, we can go on with classifying the morphemes we found. So we have miss, which is obviously a bound morpheme because it cannot stand on its own. And it's lexical because it gives us the information that something is done wrong. Then we have manage. It can stand on its own and it, ha it has its own meaning, its own lexical meaning. So it's a lexical free morpheme. And then we have meant, which is also a lexical morpheme because it tells us that um, we have something that's, that is done or a process and it cannot stand on its own, so it is a lexical bound morpheme. And now that we know this, we can go on to figure out the word formation processes. In this case, there are two because we have three morphemes. My first step that I would take is cleave off the miss. So we have management as a lexeme and miss. And if we look back at our word formation processes, that looks a lot like prefixation because we add a lexical bound morpheme or a prefix to something free, namely the word management. So we have a derivation by prefixation. And our second word formation process, excluding the miss because we've already dealt with it, is now the, the combination of the morphemes manage and ment which is another derivation, derivation, but this time a suffixation because we add the lexical bound morpheme ment or the suffix ment to the lexical free morpheme manage to form management. And that brings me to the end of my video. Thanks for watching and tune in in two weeks when we move on with syntax.